disaster preparedness organization gets every year. Um, and the idea was to do things that would help us be more prepared for, on the building side. And we had five objectives. One of those was to develop a bunch of different tools, which we have, we've been presenting them in webinars. And one of them was to support the state in developing ORSAP, which is what we're gonna be talking about today. And that one, um, we've made a lot of progress with, thanks to um, Kristen and Lance at the Office of the State Fire Marshal. So yay, <laughs> yay on that one. We have, I'll put a link later in the chat, but we have a website that kind of links to all the tools and links to these webinars and makes it easy to um, look at them later if you need to. Um, I want to mention two things before I introduce Kristen and, and mention um, the technical specialists that are on the call. One is that we have another webinar coming up next week. Um, Kristen has another one tomorrow morning at nine on this topic. So, uh, and I just sent out an email about that, but we have another one next week that is gonna be presented by really the United States leading expert on settlements. He has responded, he's an old colleague of mine, not old, but previous colleague of mine that has done um, work in foreign disasters. And so I met up with him in Haiti and I think I met him in Pakistan and he's, been working on post-earthquake, like how you do communities and settlements when people actually can't shelter in place. And he's gonna talk about that next week. And also I want everybody to know, and I'll put the um, link for this, that we're having a face-to-face -face meeting on May 17th. We're bringing in uh, the person, the acting building official from Anchorage, Alaska, that was, uh, that spearheaded their building damage assessments after their earthquake and also Tim Lynch who is from the city of New York and was working in their building damage assessments after uh, Superstorm Sandy and he has also responded in Puerto Rico to both hurricanes and earthquakes. So they're going to come and really talk down and dirty with us, not dirty but down, with us about um about the building damage assessment piece, like practically, what did they do first and what did they need? And that is an all day meeting with food on May 17th. And you need to register uh, for it because we're, we're just trying to be careful to make sure that we don't, that we're not oversubscribed. So I'm gonna put a link to both of those things in the chat a little later, but, um, and I also wanna acknowledge that Chris Wong is on, is in the meeting. Chris and um, Dave Terry's, who may also join, are both structural engineers. Chris is at Hillsboro because they stole him from the city of Portland. And Dave is at the city of Portland. And they have really been working closely with Kristen and the whole ORSAP team on developing the training module that we'll use. And you'll hear a little bit more about it. So if anybody has like technical questions in some ways of how this will work, uh, Chris and Dave have kind of held our feet to the fire about how we're going to do things. So, um, and the main presenter today, after I give you a few uh, background slides, is um, Kristen Gwynn, who I see your face on the screen, so I'm assuming everybody else does, um, is Kristen, who has been at the Office of the State Fire Marshal for nine years. She was previously um, the legislative person and then was voluntold to be involved with ORSAP. And she's been working so closely with us on kind of getting all, getting everything kind of organized. So that, and she is presenting to us today. Lexi, do you want to put the slides up? And thanks to Lexi, who's um, an architecture student from Portland State University. And she's been working with this project for a couple of years and making things work. Can you, yeah, can you put it into present? Yep, perfect. Okay, so go to the next slide and I will, um, I, I'm just gonna frame this up a little bit before we turn the time over to Kristen. So um, the authority having jurisdiction or AHJ is responsible for the building safety evaluations. So that's just something that people need to understand at the fundamental that it's the municipality's job or in Washington County, say it's the job of the people that are um, uh, 
uh, of the un, for to do the unincorporated county. But in general, this is the responsibility of the municipality, no matter how small. Um, okay, next slide. And ATC 20 or ATC, which stands for Applied Technology Council, is a group of kind of technical experts who have done research on a variety of things. But one of the things that they are the most known for is that they develop the method for these building safety evaluations, um, which are sometimes called damage assessments. But really, we're trying to get used to this terminology of building safety evaluations because it's so important to realize their job is not to assess all the damages. It's to figure out if it's safe to go in that building. Um, so the standard for evaluating buildings after an earthquake is ATC 20. Um, and ATC 20-1 is, um, I, I think it's just an updated form. Chris, you might know where that comes from, but anyway, I think it's just an updated version of ATC yeah, 20. The, the dash one is the uh, the actual field guide. So the ATC 20 is the full on manual. It's uh, over oh. 100, almost 200 pages or something like that. and. But the dash one's the actual field guide that you could carry along that has all the, um, uh, it'll guide you through all, all the, uh, it's, it's almost like a summary of the, the yeah. actual training course. Yep. Which by the way, everybody on this call, we put in an order through this project because we had a little more funding than we thought we would have. And we've ordered a bunch of these and some of you have given me your order, but if there's others that need some more for their jurisdiction, email me privately and um and we probably have some extras. So ATC 20 is earthquakes, ATC 45 is uh, wind and flooding, basically for those situations. You can see the three colors of um, placards that are used. Um, ATC 20 at this point is pretty much accepted around the world for earthquakes. Um, the thing about ATC 20, <laughs> is that they develop this great training manual and the field guide, and they develop materials to do training, but they don't certify. You can't get certified in ATC 20 or ATC 45, unless um, it, it's just important for people to realize that ATC 20 describes two kinds of assessments. One is rapid, is ca they call rapid, and one they call detailed. And We've kind of all agreed, though I'm not sure this is written in policy anywhere, but at least within this region, there's general agreement that the rapid building safety evaluation is the responsibility of the AHJ, the um, authority having jurisdiction. It's done from the outside, should take between 15 and 30 minutes, and it's the AHJ who authorizes staff to, like, every the building official can't be everywhere so it's the building official that kind of delegates authority for people to us uh to do these building safety evaluations and post on that building whether that building is safe to enter and green means it looks safe red means it absolutely does not look safe and people shouldn't enter and yellow restricted usually means maybe you can go in at this time of day or maybe you could use this entrance or maybe you could be in for 15 minutes to get your stuff or you know it has some restrictions which are written on the placard um and that placard sits on the at every entrance to the building after a major earthquake so that people understand the status of that building detailed building safety evaluations are really the responsibility of the building owner. They would probably want to get a licensed professional engineer um, to work on it. And they're detailed. They require going in the building um, and maybe two or more hours. So, and so that's a, a real critical distinction is that the AHJs are really responsible for that external rapid, is this building safe to go in or not? Okay, next slide. Um, so this is where ORSAP, which you're going to learn about today, WASAFE, which is the Washington equivalent, and Cal OES, this is where they come in. They provide, they all are based on ATC, the ATC method, and they kind of wrap around the, the actual method of inspection or doing the evaluation um, with the state's emergency system. So they say, this is how you do it in Oregon. This is what you need to be credentialed in Washington. Um, and each of these state systems provides 
certification, which ATC doesn't, for the building safety evaluators, the BSEs, um, a training module on how kind of the state emergency system works, a database of who has been certified within their state, and a call-out system for how you would deploy people or say we need everybody. Um, so California is, is the oldest and I think the best developed system. And most of the training we've done up until now is in the Cal OES SAP safety assessment program. Um, and of course, Kristen is gonna tell you about ORSAP and how we're developing this and how we're gonna ease over into our own state system and our own state requirements. So um, <clears throat> Kristen, it, are there any questions about that? Any of the things that I said, and then um, Kristen, you can take it away. Great. Next slide. So the State Fire Marshal's Office was given the safety assessment program in 2019 with the passage of House Bill 2206. And it was signed by Governor Brown in August of 2019, which directs the State Fire Marshal's Office to develop and administer the post-emergency statewide program known as ORSAP. Um, this was an unfunded mandate when it passed in 2019. So it took several sessions after 2019 to actually get the funding into our budget to move forward with ORSAP. The bill allows local governments to establish their own programs that allow the part, uh, building owners to conduct their own safety evaluations. And I just learned about this this morning, and so I'm going to try and uh, <laughs> this. Uh, Portland has a pilot program called Equip, which is based on the San Francisco program, which I believe is the gold standard. And the accelerating building reoccupancy program known as ABR is the FEMA federal program that is also based on San Francisco. And what it does, it allows building owners to enter into agreements with local governments to do their own safety, uh, safety evaluations on their buildings with a qualified uh, engineer. And they have to provide the plan to the cities to be able to do their own evaluations and recertify that plan every three years. The purpose of this program is to allow occupants, it's ocu ocu <laughs> to allow the buildings to be occupied faster than they would if they were going through possibly ORSAP. It might take a little longer. Is that about covered, yeah. Anne, or what am I missing? Yeah, you did great. Um, I, I just, I want to make one clarification. The ABR, the feds with ATC20 just did, since there were so many projects, so many programs like California's BORP and our Equip, since there were so many happening, they looked at all of them and did and and this is really a guidance document, and that so it's not a it's not a program per se. It's a guidance document. It kind of more says, this is what California does, and this is how Salt Lake is different than Oregon, and et cetera, et cetera. And they decided they needed to come up with their own acronym, and so that's where we get ABR, which is the the umbrella. So BORP is an ABR kind of program, and Equip is an ABR part kind of program. So, yeah, you got it. Thank you. Next slide, please. The bill also directed OSFM to align ORSAP with national standards, which we adopted ATC 20 by administrative rule. It also required us to develop standards and procedures for maintaining a database, certifying the evaluators, and determining when buildings can be safely occupied. Another requirement was working with local governments to identify a local program coordinator who will implement ORSAP, which the local program coordinator will be the city or county building official. And then the last uh, mandate of this bill required us to develop administrative, administrative roles, which we have done. We adopted them September of 2022, but we are now in the process of updating those OARs again, because the program has moved forward and we have a better understanding. So we have, up, they should be adopted in, I believe, hopefully May of 2023. Next slide, please. So we started out creating an advisory committee, which I believe we created um, approximately 10, 22. 
And within that committee is where we adopted, we did a lot of uh, work with the advisory committee and that's where we adopted the OARs. We have developed our own website and an online application. In the online application, you can go to our website, you can apply to be a volunteer and that information will dump right into our uh, registry, our database and let us know, it send us an email that somebody's applied and then we can go out and credential that person and make sure they've taken the appropriate training. Um, we adopted OARs in 9-7-2022 and once again, we're currently updating them and they should be adopted next month. And the registry database we have right now houses 227 Oregon volunteers that we uh, received a list from Cal OES that were certified through taking their training. Plus, we also have a list of BCD uh, evaluators that signed up originally with BCD, I don't know, years ago. So our plan for this is to be, we, we're going to be reaching out to the 227 from California that are Oregon residents that took the training and the ones on the BCD list and invite them to officially apply through our program on the website and so that we can get them badged into ORSAP. Next slide, please. When we were um, developing our advisory committee, we reached out to engineer and architects associations, OBOA and builders associations, representatives from cities and counties such as ODOT, BCD, and the, all, the, all the tribes, and then state agency partners, representatives from city and counties, I'm sorry, would be like building officials, structural engineers, architects from that work for the cities and counties. And then our state agency partners were ODOT and BCD, OEM that we invited to be on the advisory committee and then fire service through OFCA, Oregon Fire Chiefs Association, Oregon Fire Marshals Association, and then uh, county and city fire departments. We actually received a well-rounded group of um, committee members that have very diverse backgrounds that really helped OSFM to solidify our administrative rules, which we have made, like I said, we've made advances and now we're just uh, working with this, the group to re-up re -up our OARs to make them more current. Um, but thanks to Anne for all her help and Chris and David. Uh, next slide. So registering to be an evaluator with our program, you must complete an ATC basic training course, which could be a state emergency administration module of Washington, California, or Oregon training, which I'm going to let Chris kind of touch on that, um, how he developed with David, the Oregon training. Uh, building a safe building safety evaluators must register on our website. And then once they're on our website, we will credential them, verify their license and registration is current, and then we will badge them in to the program. I think we have a training slide later on that Chris can talk about the training that they developed. Next slide. So working with the stakeholders, we developed three resource types based on credentialing and qualifications experience. And then we have three specialty resource types. So resource type three would be an assistant to an, a safety assessment, a building safety evaluator. They can go out as an engineer or an unregistered architect, and they can go out and assist um, any of the different resource types and doing the safety assessments. Hey, I just wanna jump in and say, uh, one of the things is it's a kind of a safety protocol that no one ever goes alone. So this would be, Fair this type time. three would get paired up with one of the others. Next slide. So a resource type twos, they can go out and evaluate single family residents and associated accessory structures up to three stories in height and simple single story commercial structures. 
And then the qualifications are listed below. You can either be a residential building inspector, residential plans examiner, professional engineer, or certified engineer ge geologist to qualify for a resource type. And I'd like to stress that all the, the qualifications to be sent out, they have to be a current certification or license to be on the program. Uh, next slide. Next slide is resource type one. They can do all of the tasks in resource type two, plus evaluate simple commercial structures. And to be one of the credentialed as a resource type one, the list below, you can be one of, one of those. Our, our commercial building inspector, commercial plans examiner, building official, engineer, architect, Uh, I was going to ask Chris, do you have anything to add to the resource types? Um, yes, the, the uh, definition of simple structures, um, I, I believe we've left that sort of open. Um, it's going to be, I mean, there will be a guidance uh, definition to what simple will be, but I think the thought is to allow the uh, authority having jurisdiction, the building officials sort of make the determination as how they would like to utilize some of these resource types. So, um, you know, it, in the event of an emergency, when uh, the, the event exceeds what the uh, capabilities of the local jurisdiction has at that time, then they could reach up to ORSAP. ORSAP provides a list for the, uh, the different volunteers that are out there for the different resource types. So uh, you'll be receiving these resources, these uh, credentialed individuals, type one, two, or three. And with sort of, you know, the, the, the volunteer will have to be deputized within that local jurisdiction to be able to perform um, those evaluations for that jurisdiction. So at that point, they are under the um, authority having jurisdiction sort of purview and the building official will have some leeway as to how they would like to utilize some of these resource types. So, um, I, you know, with, there is no clear definition for what a simple structure is. And I just sort of want to throw that out there just to um, let everyone know that uh, I believe we purposely tried not to um, sort of confine ourselves to what the definition of a simple structure would be. So that, that was the only thing I wanted to add. And thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Um, Stay tuned, Chris, because I think I'm going to be asking you to help with the specialties too. <laughs> Next slide, please. So we came up with three specialty um, building safety evaluators that when they're badged, they'll be either a type one or a type two. And then on their badge, they'll have one of their specialties if they qualify. And so for a geological systems building safety evaluator, if they're going to do more of the soil slope foundation evaluations, um, they need to be a geotechnical engineer or a registered geologist with um, five years of experience. I'll just get through the three specialties and then let Chris uh, do comment. Uh, the next one is a structural system building safety evaluator, and they will do safety evaluations on all structures, including those designated if di difficult, complex, or significant. Once again, you need to be a structural engineer or a professional engineer with special specialization in structures and then 10 years of experience. And then the next slide is the complex architectural system building safety evaluator that will per perform non-structural assessments, evaluations on all structures. And so that would be a architect, commercial building plans examiner, or a certified building official, and then 10 years of experience, or 10 years of experience as a plans examiner in a jurisdiction with more than a 100,000 population. I'm gonna let Chris follow up with those classifications. Yeah, definitely. Um, so thank you. Um, with these specialty classifications, these are in addition to the uh, the type one, two, or three. So as a volunteer, based on their credentials, um, based on taking the ORSAP training or the Cal OES training, 
um, they, they will receive uh, whether they are a type one, type two, or a type three resource. And if they meet any of these additional qualifications, uh, then then they they will get this added specialty onto their re, to their or SAP ID card essentially. And um, the difference between the specialty um, what what a what the specialty is allowed to sort of perform the duties that they're allowed to perform versus just a standard building safety evaluator type one, two, or three is really the ability to perform the detailed evaluation. So as a resource type one, two, or three, um, they're only allowed to perform the rapid uh, evaluations. That's what they're credentialed for and qualified for. So to perform detailed evaluations, which um, Ann had touched on earlier, it's essentially, um, the detailed evaluations are a more thorough and complex sort of evaluation. Um, it's there is another evaluation type above the detailed evaluation that ATC twenty um, sort of qualifies or or they don't they don't train people for, but they do identify that there is a engineered evaluation. So that's even that's a third type of um, evaluation type that is recognized um, through some of the FEMA standards. So. Um, but anyways, with the specialty uh, resource type, the the people that have these qualifications can perform the two to three hour detail evaluations um, for jurisdictions if the need arises. And where the need might arise sometimes are on those yellow tags where, uh, you know, if we, you performed a rapid, you've identified that there might be something, some areas that don't look right. And one of the restrictions on there is, you know, um, uh, no entrance into the living room of this building unless a detailed evaluation is performed. And then at that time, if, um, you know, if someone does approach the authority having jurisdiction to see if they have anyone qualified to perform a detailed evaluation, it would be one of the, uh, the specialty type uh, resources to, to call upon. So. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next slide. So ORSAP training is a little different than the actual ATC 20, ATC 20 training. So ORSAP training will involve um, state training from Department of State Fire Marshal, which when Chris or David or whoever's giving the ATC 20 training for Oregon will be hopefully be including these slides into their presentation. The training will involve um, the state process how volunteers get badged and credentialed, how they can apply for the program, how they're gonna get their workers' comp and liability covered, how they'll get their per diem covered, and the mobilization process, how they will actually be called up and mobilized out to local governments. We're hoping to have this available by, the, by June, by the end of June, so that it can be included in Chris and David's training and also if you take, if they sign up, if people sign up to be a volunteer and they've taken Cal OES or Washington training or another approved ATC training, they will have to take this portion of the, of the ORSAP training. So we'll be submitting, we haven't worked it out yet, but they'll be getting the slides to the ORSAP training so that they know how the state process works. Uh, the building safety evaluators will have to be are required to take a refresher training every five years. Once again, that would be an Oregon training, California, Washington, or an approved ATC 20 training. Uh, our next steps. Wait, Kristen, can I just jump in? Yeah. Um, it's actually Chris and Dave that have helped develop this ORSAP training with your guidance and um, Right now, this week today, Clackamas County is hosting a bunch of ATC 20 slash 45 courses, and then they're going to have an extra half a day where they do Cali OES. So we're going to probably at the end of May and the beginning of June offer about five sessions of the ORSAP training module. And we will reach out to, um, you know, all these folks that are taking the course now from Clackamas County, all at least as somebody from the city of Portland, all of our folks that are um, that are registered in the city as having taken ATC 20 and uh, and maybe the you have that list of 227 that you got from Cal OES. So we'll re reach out to all of them and let them know that this is 
available so that we can get more people certified and knowing in the organ in the organ system as opposed to at some point you're gonna quit transferring them over from California. So anyway, so that is coming to a Zoom screen near you by the end of May. Well, that's exciting. Uh, Chris, did you want to add about the training you've developed? Yeah, so um, currently, uh, because the ORSAP program is accepting Cal OES, SAP, and WASAFE credentialed individuals, um, myself and Dave Terry's with the City of Portland, uh, we are actually trained uh, Cal OES uh, safety ass assessment program um, evaluator trainers. Um, I completed my course late last year, and um, when David had approached a group of us about anyone wanting to volunteer to put together a training for the ORSAP program, I I volunteered, and um, what I've sort of done so far uh, while working along with David is um, we've tried to imp we've we've tried to supplement the Cal OES uh, safety assessment program training with the Oregon information. So um, I, you know, after speaking with Cal OES, I wasn't allowed to delete anything from their actual training material. So when, I, um, when we are giving a training, we're going through the full Cal OES program, but um, we've added about 150 uh, additional slides. And it was really to cover more of the ATC 20 and 45 um, training elements that uh, Cal OES was sort of light on. Uh, WASAFE's training module is different than Cal OES's and theirs were, were pretty heavy on um, the ATC 20 um, portion of it. So we, with WASIT, with Washington's blessing, we've actually taken a lot of their um, their slides and um, sort of repurposed it for our own training here. And, um, you know, there's an additional part of that 150 slides we've added to the presentation. Um, there's an additional 30 slides uh, that cover the ORSAP program, and that's still a work in progress, like what Kristen's saying, because there's still a lot of um, the processes that we're, we're sort of working through. Um, but uh, as for training offerings, I, I believe there's quite a few there um, coming up this year, and mentioned um, the one in Clackamas that her program's um, putting on. And actually, uh, through the Oregon Building Officials Association in two weeks from now, Myself and um, my my colleague, my chief plans examiner here at the city of Hillsborough, we're putting on three day three three different sessions of training at the Oregon Building Officials Association to um, provide the Cal OES SAP training, but we're also providing the uh, the Oregon supplement within that training. So, um, Kristen will be hopefully getting a lot of <laughs> uh, new volunteers through this process as, as well. So, um, um, that was. <laughs> I just want to jump in there uh, in case there's anybody confused and also mention an additional training up in Clark County, the city of Vancouver is doing a WASAFE all day face-to-face -face training, I think next week, April 24th, I think. So uh, they have that training and Megan, I noticed that Megan Fletcher from Clark County is, uh, I wonder if you guys have the link and can put it in the chat for the um, the Clark County, it's not Clark County, it's city of Vancouver. Yes, but, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, of course. Terry, do you, did you have something that you wanted to say or ask before I, okay, nice to see your face. Um, I just want to say, cause this sounds like when, when Chris said a hundred extra slides, I, I didn't, I noticed that nobody jumped off the uh, webinar. So I'm glad I just wanted to say about the training. It's, it, you know, it's all these state systems that have wrapped around ATC 20 and kind of adapted. And that's what, and so right now what's going on in Clackamas is one day that's just ATC 20 and 45. So that's one day's worth of training, but it doesn't include the state system. And so they're having an extra two or three hours a day, a half a day later that'll do Cal OES. And we hope to just do the Oregon thing which we're thinking is one hour um, to offer it on top of the others. So it's the it's the kind of the method of which you're wrapping around ATC 20. Like there's an ATC 20 standalone and then there's how we will do ORSAP, which would be the organ system and ATC 20 within it. And then there's Cal OES with ATC. It's so 
you can see that there's a bunch of permutations plus wasafe with their own version. So there's a bunch of permutations of a way to do it. And probably what we have now is the ORSAP module that is just about ORSAP and not about the structural, what you look for basically. For, and correct, then, Andy. Yeah, th thank you for clarifying that because I, I do want to say that um, the 150 slides was specific <laughs> to the training that I am, that, you know, that I'm putting on at the OVOA. Um, and again, that that all that was meant to supplement the the lack of the ATC twenty um, material that was in the Cal OES one because they they've they've tailored their training specifically to to their state and they talk about a lot of the lifeline systems and um, yeah but, but yes the training that we're planning on putting on to supplement the training that's going on at Clackamas and the standalone ORSAP is more it, it's it's not going to be as intense. Uh, intensive. It's it's really to cover the processes and the uh, procedures of the program itself, and not the ATC twenty material, like you're saying. So. Yeah, which is really about the structural stuff. So right. anyway, you can see it's kind of a work in progress. If it wasn't for Chris and for um, Dave, really pushing forward to develop some of this so that they could give the training, and um, that's really helped uh, move us forward. But but it's still kind of draft form, right? You guys are going to give this training at OBOA, and I'm sure that after that, you'll put your heads together and decide if it needs to adapt. Right. So, okay. I'm going to put myself back on mute. <laughs> so the next steps for this Oregon Safety Assessment Program is we are working on developing a mobilization process with local governments. And tentatively, it's going to look like a emergency manager calls into OEM and request resources. Resource uh, OEM will reach out to our office with what counties need resources or cities. And then we will take our list and divide up those resources based on some formula we haven't developed yet. And then provide the list to the local governments for them to call up and mobilize the volunteers. Um, tentatively, that looks that is what it looks like hopefully be working with KJ on that. Workers' comp liability insurance for the building safety evaluators I know has come up on, in trainings and how that's going to work. And we believe the process, we have it after many conversations with DAS and OEM, we believe that process is a building safety evaluator gets injured in Clackamas County. They go to the building official who will go to, I'm assuming their risk manager. I could be wrong, Anne, is that correct how that would work? They would go to the risk manager at the county level and then they would submit the safe form for workers comp to Oregon Emergency Manager's office for processing. It does not come to the state fire marshal's office. It'll go to OEM. I don't think we've completely worked that out. We did, I did have a conversation with Lance about that when you were uh, gone. And anyway, I don't think it's totally worked out how that will be, but the way you're sketching it out is I can't kind of think how we were all thinking. And for anybody else on here that has other thoughts or other experience, this would be a good time to express your thoughts on how to yeah. do this. Yeah, that would be nice because we were struggling with how this is going to work, but I think by statute, OEM is the final place for the workers' comp and liability claims. We are also going to be creating policies and procedures for out-of-state aid, which again, once again, I think we'll be working with KJ or OEM on how that will play out. And then our ultimate goal in a couple of years is to have a full-scale exercise is with uh, getting funding for that and getting participants with as many counties and cities as we can and make that happen. I think that would be pretty fun. Next slide. And then right now we're developing a marketing plan to promote ORSAP to uh, local governments to help them develop their own safety ass assessment program and also to promote ORSAP to pr uh, potential future building safety evaluators. So we should be rolling that out. We're working with our uh, public information office on getting this program, uh, getting this flyer and a whole marketing, Facebook, our newsletter 
to roll it out in by June. And then we're looking into identifying some grant funding opportunities. It's my understanding that FEMA has some grant funding for safety assessment programs that we'd like to tap into, um, hopefully maybe to help with the full scale exercise materials, the ATC 20-1 field guides or other resources for local cities and counties. And then once again, we're establishing, which I've already talked about, OSFM's training, state training course on, you know, the state processes. Uh, next slide. Okay, so that is our program is to date. Uh, Chris, do you have anything to add? Um, I would Oh, actually, I do. Um, so I recently sat in on a uh, the Wall Safes. Um, they they have a monthly meeting, and I, I do just want to throw it out there that uh, I think they are working, from what my understanding, uh, to potentially see if uh, anyone that's ORSAP certified, they could potentially um, become Wall Safe certified. Um, I, I think they'll they'll probably reach out to you, Chris, <laughs> uh, but um, as long as uh, they take Wall Safes sort of standalone training module. Um, and right now, uh, anyone that's Cal OES certified, uh, they can also apply for Washington's um, uh, certification cr credentialing as well, uh, as long as they take that, that module. And to date, I, I believe WASAFE's program has 375 volunteers on their database. So we're actually not too far behind. <laughs> oh. uh, Cal California has 10,000. So I, I, I told them, since they were gracious enough to invite me to, to their meeting, I told them I'll just mention it, um, that if anyone out there is interested in, you know, helping the Washington out and registering for their list, um, that, that is, there's an opportunity for that as well. As long as, long as you have, uh, currently, as long as you have Cal SAP credentialing, and then in the future, it sounds like they might be looking into um, allowing ORSAP credentialing yeah, for, for their program as well. That's exciting. It looks like, Terry, you have a question from Sandy. Well, just a comment, and that is uh, we're talking about both states. I'm attending next. I'm scheduled to be attending that Monday day uh, training for WASAFE up there at the ATC 20 in Vancouver. Um, I'm curious how many of the Portland employees and other jurisdictional employees um, actually live in Washington State like myself. Here. I live 50 miles away from Sandy in Washington. So recognizing that I've crossed the Bridge of the Gods twice a day, that bridge will probably be down if we have the big one, and along with all the other bridges, in which case, whatever side of the river I'm on, that's the one I want to be trained for and prepared to help. So thank well, you. That's a great comment, and it's a perfect segue. Another part of the RBDEP project was to develop a stranded worker agreement for people just like you, Terry, <laughs> who live in one place and work for another jurisdiction so that you can work wherever you're stranded. So we are, we've are we sent that out to the counties and um, it's under um, signatures and stuff now. And we're sending, well, I'll be sending an email out to each of the jurisdictions. The, uh, the I think Terry, and tell me what you think about this. This might be a huger deal for Portland. Now like in Portland, I have, 150 people that would qualify as building safety evaluators. And I do have the Everbridge notification system. So I do know where they live. I mean, I can kind of tell that there are people that don't live within our jurisdiction. So we can figure that out. And it might be way easier to figure out if you were a small jurisdiction, Terry, you know how many people that are qualified to inspect work with you in Sandy. But with for this stranded worker agreement or the swag to work, you kind of have to know your people and know like, you know that you live in Washington. So you know that you need to make sure and get that jurisdiction in Washington to also sign that so that people can work where they're stranded. So that's a, that's a, it's complex. Lexi is working with me on that and we're going to reach out to people, but it's, it's going to be a complex thing. And there, there are people that are outside the RDPO region, outside even Clark County, um, and in other counties that where where that it's so we've set it up so that they can sign also, but it gets it's a complex web. <laughs> yeah, good point. I I'm in actually uh, Skamania County, uh, near yeah. Stevenson, Washington. So yeah. yeah. But 
but Megan, you can maybe speak to this or, um, I talked to Anthony Vendetti, who used to be the Clark County kind of person. And it's it. my understanding is that Washington is kind of covered, like that hopefully Clark will sign the um, stranded worker agreement for the people that need to go back and forth. But within Washington, I think there is some mutual aid agreement that means people can work within the other cities. So I, I don't think it's a problem within Washington. It's much more of a challenge between Oregon and Washington for people that live in one state and work in another. Megan, do you know anything more about that than what I said? I think I heard it from Anthony and not from you. So not to put you on the spot. Okay. Is there, are there any other comments or questions? Um. There is a phrase that uh, uh, that a prophet is not without merit except in his own land. Um, and I have been urging Wasaf to think about what happens if we have the Cascadia event. Uh, right now, Wasaf is of the mindset that they will register people and they will have enough people. The problem with volunteers is if the if the event is in your backyard and you're a registered engineer architect, you are suddenly busier than you have ever been in your career with your clients. And so I've so far, at least in WASAFE terms, they're they haven't heard that message. They've they've heard it, but they have closed their ears to it. If we have the M9 on Cascadia, we get the full rip and a nine to 9.5. We are going to need a lot of people from out of state. Um, NCSEA has about 4,000 people across the country. What's NCSA? Can you do the acronym? National, National Council of Structural Engineering Associations. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Cal OES has people outside of the West Coast uh, who have uh, credentials. Um, so I would ask you to think about how you would do a quick module if you had to be bringing in volunteers yeah. uh, from uh, outside of the West Coast. Yeah. And, and Ed, I, I, to add to that, I will say that that's why we're trying to get Osbeals, the state licensing board, to allow out-of-state licenses because we know we're going to need to do that. And and also, Chris and I were talking about the slides yesterday. Chris has some pretty good slides in there to let people, you know, about the subduction zone, just some basic stuff that reminds people of what's going on here. And that would be very helpful to someone coming in from out-of-state as well. Sure, sure. Um, since I keep getting requests for trainings in Oregon, uh, and I'm more than glad to do it. It's a, in, my, in my new sole proprietorship, that's part of what I do. Um, I will certainly jump at the opportunity to become ORSAP certified, and particularly as a trainer, if, I, if that works out uh, once, the, once things are up and running, because, you know, if People keep contacting me. I'm glad to do it, but I should be able to do that part of it too. Ed, um, I think we're all thrilled that that is the case. I just have a question for you. You know, because I the ones I've seen you present were all Cal OES SAP was wrapped around the training. So would you do, like, how would you do it? Would you just do ATC 20? And especially in your professional judgment, because I know you're doing this week, an ATC 20 slash 45, and then the module, the state module later, and you're doing a WASAFE that's cramming, it's just ATC 20 and WASAFE, right? Not 45. That's and that's what the city of Vancouver asked for. Right, but so you can see that there's a lot of permutations just in terms of as a teacher, would you do, could you do an ATC 20 with just ORSAP and not the Cal OES? Like, would that be a day's training or we're thinking the module just by itself will be 60 minutes? 
Right, right. And so it would be less than a full day's training, probably. ATC 20 is, um, you know, I always hesitate to tell you how long uh, one of these trainings is going to be because it depends on the class and how, how in, interactive the class gets. Um, yeah. I've had um, the shortest ATC 45 class I've ever given was to the uh, uh, Coast Guard in Indianapolis. And why the Coast Guard has a base in Indianapolis, I still don't understand. Uh, <laughs> because there's no coast there. <laughs> but that training, the, the way they are taught to respond to training is to sit there wide-eyed and not ask questions. And a normal four-hour training was done in under three hours because there was no interaction. Right at the end, one brave lieutenant raised his hand and asked a question. I don't know if he got demoted because of that or not. Uh, well, <laughs> um, Chris but, Wong had to drop off, but Dave, in, in terms of the ORSAP piece and how we're how you guys are thinking of doing like ATC twenty with ORSAP, what are you guys thinking about in terms of how long of a training it would be? I mean, I I think it would work pretty well. He, he could do it. It's it won't be a whole lot to add. It's not like where the Cal OES has a lot of slides that they want to be included, whereas ORSAP doesn't really have that yet. So it would be not very difficult to put it in and maybe even throw in some 45 stuff just to make sure there's thoughts about maybe there's five buildings that survived the tsunami and this is what they might look like. So uh, I think it will work out quite well. Uh, and that's definitely something we could talk about offline. Yeah, I, I definitely think... To my mind, Cal OES, I'm a trainer. I do the training. If someone wants an ATC 2045 with Cal OES, it adds a, another couple hours beyond what you want to do in a day, but you get a full ATC 45 training on it. And with global warming and, you know, we had a point earlier this year where every river in, or last year, every river in Washington State, Western Washington rather, was at flood stage. Wow. You know, so, um, you know, we are, we need to be thinking forward to uh, that, to the tsunami situation. Uh, and I don't think Cal OES's thinking has gone that direction yet. So I, I like ATC 20 with some additional slides for, uh, from ATC 45, uh, and then your ORSAP module. Um, it doesn't hurt to put in some of the initial slides from uh, from Cal OES that talk about uh, NIMS and and where to let people know where they fit into the um, you know who they report to and where they fit in the command structure. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's somewhat helpful, but uh, yeah, I think it can easily be done under a day. But ATC twenty plus WASAFE, ATC twenty plus ORSAP, I think really gets people what they need and they can probably pick up the rest of it uh in the field okay so that as a minimum all right well thank you ed thank you you just popped into watch and we've we've uh used your expertise a lot um thank you thanks to dave terry's for coming in when he's sick to make sure we got the technical side and thanks so much to Kristen for doing the presentation and preparing it and all the you can't imagine the number of hours of behind the scenes work that went to get us this far. And thanks to Sandra for doing um, the, the tech for the Zoom. So we all this will be posted. Sandra will put, we did a webinar, this webinar yesterday. So we're gonna combine them to in a, and that will be posted on the RBDAP website. And uh, the slides will also um, be posted and so yes, it's all available and please share it. The more people that are aware, the better. And is that rbdep.net? It's rdpo.net and then rbdep is a project within that. So okay. it, it, I think it's building damage assessment, but you there's a slider there that goes through the projects and I just wait till I see the building damage assessment and click on it when it gets to that. So. Perfect, thank you. All right, thanks everybody.